Today we'd like to um, introduce you to a topic uh, of great importance um, in dealing with uh, the housing crisis and the homeless crisis. We got to be better and more efficient in how we, we do uh, a build, a building of, of homes and other um, elements. Um, and our, our research colleague um, from the College of Design is here to uh, speak with us today. I would like to introduce Professor Pardis Pishtad. Um, she is uh, Associate Professor um, and leads the uh, uh, Smart Built Environmental Ecosystem Group, otherwise known as Smart Bees, the Smart Bees Lab. Um, and I think she's been here 10 years and she's been a, a great partner and uh, please join me in welcoming her. Thank you, Professor Brown. Well, thank you everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, I'm honored to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Um, as um, Professor Brown introduced me, I'm um, an associate professor at Georgia Tech, but not in, in your college. I'm in the College of Design, um, School of Building Construction. So what I'm about to present is going to kind of broaden your horizon because it's not what you typically have taken courses about um, and so hopefully by hearing this presentation you can think about how you can apply uh, the great analytical knowledge that you're learning in your different courses and see to what extent you can apply it to the built environment industry. So the topic of my presentation is about reimagining the future of, of construction industry. I have a question for you. So if you had a crystal ball to see what the future of the built environment looks like, the future of our buildings, the buildings that you're actually um, living in, the future of our cities. How would you imagine a different building, different cities? So I'm pretty sure many of you are uh, a fan of science fiction movies. Um, so you, you can have some ideas of what it would look like. So this presentation is going to take a glimpse at what are the possibilities, and then how can we get ready for that? So um, the process of creation through mankind civilization has always been the same. We start with an idea, with an imagination, with a dream in our mind, and that's called an imag imaginary twin and then we use a means of communication to communicate what we are imagining um, in order to make it a reality, right? And these medium of communications have taken a um, variety of forms. Um, and I will get to what are the different means of, of those communication. And then after that, it, it gives birth to the physical reality uh, or physical twin. And it's an iterative process, right? Any idea, you cannot get it right 100% the very first time. It, it evolves your idea, it's first concept, then you further develop it. And, and it's through the means of communication that you, you look at it, you analyze it, no, this is not exactly what I want, let's go to version two, let's go to version three, unless it's eventually what you like it, and that's when you try to uh, create what you imagined. So in the built environment, uh, in architecture and construction, these, these means of communication have evolved from um, physical mock-up, uh, then they invented 2D blue, blueprints to represent what they in, envision in terms of the design of the buildings, then um, building information modeling, and most recently, augmented reality and virtual reality, where you can actually put the goggles on and, and see exactly, fill the 3D space environment of what you envisioned of how your building looks like. As we, the thinker, give birth to these ideas, it's very interesting if we reflect on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and Maslow is a psychologist, and this Maslow's hierarchy of need basically says that human being needs are classified into different layers. The very primary need that we have is need of survival, right? We need shelter, we need food. And then once that need is met, 
then, um, then we go to descend, ascend to the next layer. We need, uh, we have psychological needs, needs for prestige, needs for belonging, and needs a sense of accomplishment. And once that need is met, we actually transcend to the top of the pyramid. And that's when we go beyond ourselves um, and we become self-actualizer. And what is a self-actualizer? Self-actualizer are um, when we go beyond self and we are all about what can I contribute, how can I serve, and, um, and we, became very, we become very, very creative once we are at, at the top of this pyramid. So in a sense, we transcend from surviving all the way to thriving. So parallel to this Maslow's hierarchy of need, our need for buildings have, have changed. At the beginning of the civilization, all we cared about was just to have a shelter, right? And once that need was met, we said, you know what, we just don't need a shelter, we need sustainable buildings, we care about our environment, we care about, we, we want better buildings. And then now we are um, after creating smart buildings. And this is going to continue to evolve, then we will have a next generation of smarter, smarter buildings, right? So we are not going to stop, but my point is, we are, um, we as a thinker, as we evolve, our um, imaginations and our needs also change. So in a sense, in a sense the smart buildings are kind of bio-inspired buildings, right? So what we are trying to do is to try to make our buildings um, just like how human building functions, right? So human buildings, we have sensors. We, we can sense, we can smell, we can see, we can hear. Um, and so how about if we, have, we design buildings that can also um, scan their environment and understand what's happening? Um, we have nervous system that communicates what our senses pick up and transfer those signals to our brain. So what if we have buildings that have networks, um, a wireless network that can send the signal from sensors um, to the database? We have brain, and that's where data storage, our data storage and um, um, data analysis takes place. And now we are thinking about cloud and artificial intelligence in, in our buildings. Body parts and muscles in charge of command and control. And in our buildings, we're deploying building automation and control system and actuators. So, so this is our vision of bio-inspired smart buildings. So let's take a, a look at this video that kind of demonstrate what, uh, our, our, what a smart building could do. This is 22 Bishopsgate, a new building that's been designed to house 12,000 staff. And from the ground up, technology has been built in. In fact, if you're an employee, then you enter the building by using an app. As soon as you walk in, Bluetooth beacons will recognize you. And if you're a visitor, well, you get sent a QR code. There's a facial recognition option too, no standard reception desk, and even the lifts can know where to take you. And if you'd arrived by the much encouraged method of cycling, the app would have told you where there was a bike space too. And once you're at work, you can also book a meeting room through the app and that means when you arrive you don't need to touch anything, you can just walk straight in. And if you don't turn up on time, well it won't be long before it's made available to someone else. And once you enter the room, well up here is a movement sensor, so it can keep track of the number of people who are in here and exactly where they're standing. So if the air conditioning needs to be turned up or down, that can happen automatically. There's also an air quality sensor over here. The air in this building at the moment is pretty good, but if it does become poorer, then the air holding unit can try and purify it. The Smart Spaces platform's AI is still learning and eventually it should be able to make its own decisions. But right now it does still need a human to make those changes based on the incoming information. 
the benefits of the smartphone bring all these systems into a single place, we then have those actionable insights from the data that is generated. For instance, on this floor, if the CO2 levels exceed 600 uh, parts per million, we can then increase the fresh air to this space. So um, you haven't had to think about that. You, so in an old building, you might be feeling tired. Here, that's not going to happen. All of the data that's being collected through people's phones and the sensors in the building is brought together here on what's called the digital twin. And this gives the opportunity to the building manager to be able to make any changes as and when they're needed. So that means that the climate or the lighting can easily be amended. And if you want to zoom in to one spot, you can just tap on a table. You can make this bigger or smaller. You can really interact with it pretty well. It's almost like being in there right now. Then over here, we've got the air quality and also the energy that's being used in the building. And this is a vital part. There's no point in air conditioning where there are unexpectedly no staff, for instance. That gave you a glimpse of what smart building can do. But smart building um, only operates in a smart digital twin uh, or cyber physical ecosystem. And what, is, what is digital twin? What is cyber physical ecosystem? So basically what we are uh, trying to do in the built uh, industry is that we are um, incorporating a concept called digital twin um, or building information modeling, right? So building information modeling or digital twin is a digital replica of, um, of the design of the building. It basically simulates the performance, the design of the building and the performance of the building. Then um, during construction, the digital, we, we start to have the actual building, right? The actual building is called physical twin. The digital representation of the building is called digital twin. So digital twin during construction um, adds additional construction related data to the BIM model or to the digital twin. So it's, a, it's the as-built BIM. And then during operation and maintenance, we have a cyber physical system. And, and this cyber physical system is made of the digital twin integrated with the physical twin, which is the actual building. And there is a flow of a bi-directional flow of information between the physical twin, the actual building that has sensors that collects data about the performance of the building, and the digital twin that has the digital information um, of, the, of the building. So digital twin can predict the future failure, right? Um, the future maintenance, preventive maintenance issues while the physical twin provides input to the digital twin as how am I actually fun functioning? Why is this important that we create this integration and by flow of data? It is important because if the feedback that the digital twin receives from the sensors can inform the future designers and engineers to know that to what extent the simulation, the initial simu simulation that they had was actually realistic, right? So is the building actually performing as they predicted it or not, right? So it can inform future design and engineering. In addition to that, we are able to have a better operation and more effective operation and maintenance of the building, right? By, by continuously um, in real time collecting data about the building performance and managing our buildings. So this story or this notion of the smart built environment really reminds me of the um, history behind computers, right? The very first computers that were invented was, in, was invented for the purpose of, um, of basically doing some commands, right? They want, the human being wanted these computers to be interactive machines capable of doing some calculations or operations, right? So the very first generation was calculators, then we had computers. Then later on they said, wouldn't it be nice if my computer with your computer with another computer can actually exchange data, right? So we, let's create a network among our computers to be able to 
um, transfer packets of data from this computer to another computer. And then it was scaled up and internet was born, right? And we're kind of doing the same thing. We are thinking that we can have embed IoT devices in our building. They can collect data. And then these data um, can, can form a packet of data for each building. And then we are also talking about what if we connect different buildings together and, um, and create a network of buildings. And this network of buildings with all these databases can inform uh, a city uh, IoT network. So again, right, same concept um, that we are basically borrowing from the computer industry, bring it, bringing it to the built environment industry. So basically, this is a vision of a future smart built environment, right? We have different um, communities, um, campus, like Georgia Tech, um, residential communities, healthcare communities, commercial office, and each of these communities have different buildings. Within these buildings, there are sensors, data gets collected, and the data collected from each community um, can be transferred to inform the IoT, larger cities IoT network. And in turn, the larger IoT city network can inform the residents of these communities. But so what? What's the benefit of creating, having this vision or creating this network of data? I want to hear your thoughts. Exactly. Very good examples, right? So two examples, outbreak, right? Where is the out outbreak happening in the community? Um, the grocery stores often, you know, the supply, paper toilet story, you remember that, how <laughs> many stores were running out of paper toilet. Uh, so how could you be informed in terms of, I, uh, I, I need this product where would I go in my community, right? So all the supply information is actually updated in, um, in commercial or in healthcare, and this updated real-time data is communicated with the larger IoT network where the residents have access to. So these are how, um, or if I'm a resident of my house and I, I get sick with COVID and I report it, that could form a packet of data that comes from my residential community to the larger network. So if we create, if we have this vision and strategically create what data to be collected at what level, we can create, uh, we can have a smarter, more um, effective way of running our, our life. So, but to this, this, this is a nice vision to have, smarter buildings, smarter cities, but, but let's be realistic. What we are seeing right now in the built environment industry is that we um, have a, an increasingly growing number of specializations, right? Every, every year, every decade, we see that there is this new uh, specialization that is emerging, um, and we have new set of consultants, new jobs, and more than ever, we see that there are specialized individuals who have very specialized knowledge, but they, have, they don't have uh, the capability to actually uh, communicate with the other professionals that have different uh, areas of expertise, right? And we are talking about building, creating buildings that are very harmonized, that are very smart, and, and these buildings are necessitate the input of all these different specializations, okay? So we see that from 18th century where we had the master builders who were in charge of design and construction, we only had master builders. We didn't even have architects. We didn't have engineers. We didn't have contractors. We had master builders who know how to design, how to engineer, and how to build, and they build buildings. Now we have great array of specializations that have to come together as, a, as, a, as one entity to, to build the project. So we see that we have moved away from unity to divergence, um, siloed specializations. 
we have moved away from a simple handshake. Um, there was great deal of trust. People in their community know uh, this person is trustworthy. Um, they gave a handshake, built my project, and we're good. Now we set contracts with a bunch of um, liability clauses, risk shifting clauses, because we simply don't trust and we don't know each other. Um, we are in the age of globalization. Uh, you know, great number of individuals in the market and you really don't know, you really cannot trust. So we have moved away from unity to fragmentation. And let's face it, with the place where we are right now, it's impossible to get where our vision is. And, and we see the result of that in the industry. We see lack of productivity in the construction industry that we see in the other manufacturing industry, the productivity rate has increased versus in the construction industry has almost stayed the same since 1960. I, this one is 1995, but I saw another graph that was 1960 and that was even flatter than this. Lack of trust, uh, labor shortages, and broken supply chain. Right? These are the key pressing issues in the built environment. And unless we address these key issues, we are not able to materialize or manifest the notion of smart buildings, not even dumb buildings. <laughs> so we cannot do that. We cannot get from here to where we envision. But I'm an optimist. So optimists see opportunities in challenges when pessimists only see obstacles. So what can we get out of these problems that we see? How can we address them? So in my research, I have been studying emerging trends and technologies um, for realizing the notion of the smart built environment. And I was looking at how these emerging trends and solutions can actually address these four key issues. Divergence, a solution could be convergence and integrated approaches that could bring together all these different specializations and make them act in a harmonious way as one entity. Addressing broken supply chain, again, this potential solution could be convergence and digital transformation. Addressing mistrust could happen. We can um, use relational contracting. We can also use trust augmenting technologies like blockchain. And for addressing productivity and labor shortage, we can uh, think about industrializing construction. So together, all these four solutions, I see that it, they, these solutions make two key impacts. And these key impacts are that they increase trust and collaboration, and they also increase the efficiency. The efficiency um, during design, engineering, construction, even operation and maintenance. So the entire life cycle of the project. So, so in my lab, smart built environment ecosystem, smart bees, and, and bees, inspired by bees as creatures who are collaborative um, and build modular honeycomb. <laughs> In my lab, uh, the Smart Bees uh, lab members, yes? Uh, in this previous slide, you mentioned trust augmenting technologies. What is that? Trust augmenting technologies. Yes, I'll, I'll get to that. So I have a section that I talk about trust augmenting technologies. Good question. Um, and one example is blockchain, so I get to that. So in my Smart Biz Lab, um, the PhD students and master students who are working, they are working in these four key camps that, addresses, um, that address these key issues. So one group of students work on integrated and trust building approaches. Um, and we have another, um, researchers who are work on digital transformation, whether it be building information modeling, digital twin, IoT, uh, industrializing construction, focusing on modularization, and trust augmenting technologies, um, mainly blockchain and building information modeling. So I, um, 
I am going to go one by one talking about the, the research studies that we have done for each of these uh, issues and the potential solutions. So for addressing divergence and fragmentation, uh, we propose using convergence, the opposite, and integration. So how can we bring back all these different specialization and make them act as one smart entity? So this one solution is utilizing relational contract, right? And, and this is a very um, deep topic that I cannot touch it possibly in one hour lecture. So I can just give you a, a, a very brief overview. So, so we are proposing that instead of transactional contracts with full of risk shifting clauses, we deploy relational contract, right? And we use clauses that share risks and rewards of different stakeholders involved. So if I tell you we either, either one wins and all win, or one loses and all loses, all lose. So, so that means that we all have skin in the game. It's no longer you win and I may lose, right? We either win it all together or we either lose it all together. This way we can align the business interests of all these different entities, different consultants, different engineers, different contractors, align them to basically meet the goals for the project. If the goal of the project is to create a harmonized, smart, built environment, then let's put that as a goal and let's say you all either achieve that and make profit in the end, or you're going to go bankrupt. Um, so relational contracting um, is, is a solution, is a potential solution. Working on making integrated teams and integrated processes, right? So we are all different members, but how can we, um, we act as a team and how can we design our processes that are more integrated? And, and then lastly is, is working on creating system-based trust. And what is a system-based trust, right? So in the past, as I said, people relied on who they knew and what was the reputation of that person, right? So I, if, I, if I knew you, I have long-term relationship with you and, and my experience with you had been good, then we have established this effect-based trust or cognition-based trust. So I, I, I know I can trust you and I can work with you on this project. But in this day and age where you have so many different companies and members of these companies are you know, people that you don't know, how can you really trust, trust these people? So there is a different kind of trust called system-based trust, and the system-based trust says that based on the existing infrastructure that are in place, uh, I know that you cannot betray me. I know that if you lie, you get caught, because for example, we have this blockchain network that can determine who manipulated the data, so therefore I can, so it, it's in a sense, there is a system in place that makes me feel safe and secure. Therefore, even though that I don't know you because of this existing system, I feel like I can trust you. So that's called, that's a kind of trust that is formed as a result of a, a, a system contract organizational structure in place. So, so we are proposing that we may not be, we may not be able to achieve that fake based trust, but we can work, we can use systems that could promote trust. And the good news is that the industry, our industry, built environment industry, have already started moving away from fragmentation to integration. And as you can see, we have different forms of project delivery methods. Um, and and throughout the history, we see that we have, we have started now, over the past few decades, bringing and involving different entities early and earlier in the process. So in the very traditional model, the owner would come, they hire an architect, a design engineer firm, and then once the design engineer is done with their design, then the contractor, the builder comes and build the project. And there is very minimum um, level of inter interaction or integration 
between the designer and contractor. But as you can see in the, in the newer form of um, project delivery models, we are bringing the contractors early and early on even when the designer is on board, right? And what's the benefit of that? It, it, the benefit is the exchange of knowledge between the designer and builder, right? We're talking about, you, you, we have this different specialization, but, but they are not integrated, they are not collaborative. In order to create that integration, you have to have this dialogue between them. You have to have this early, early involvement. So integrated project delivery is the newest form of project delivery model that has been proposed in order to address these divergence and fragmentation issues. So if you want to have to create this convergence, then IPD is a great model because it, it involves the designer, contractor, owner right at the beginning of the project. It implements shared risk and reward model, right? So we either lose, one lose and all lose, or one win and all win. And then um, there is a joint governance and, and collaborative decision making involves. So all these different practices promote integration and creates team. So in our research, we actually investigated what are the attributes that builds trust? What are, the, what are different types of trust? How trust is formed between uh, individuals? How trust is formed between individual and organizations? And um, whether or not project delivery models can actually impact trust. And, and we found that it does, it actually does. So different IPD traits like contractual, organizational, managerial actually build system-based trust. And, um, and also behavioral principle of IPD like open communication, mutual trust and respect, um, co-location, um, these can actually promote cognition-based trust. So, so that was one of the research that Smart Biz Lab, in Smart Biz Lab we, we've done to see how we can address the issue of divergence and, and, and move to a more um, uh, integrated approaches. So addressing bro broken supply chain, we saw in, in pandemic how um, the, on the lack of visibility to the supply chain and, and unavailability of certain products really delayed uh, completion of, of many construction projects. And, and it, was, it was really a problem. It was really a problem. So, so how can we actually, how can we prevent that in the future, right? We, we, if we have a, yet another pandemic coming God forbid, how can we make sure that next time we are ready, we have the infrastructure to have visibility to our supply chain so that these things won't happen again? So one of the proposals or one of the research uh, studies that we have done is, is um, basically looking at different constituencies in the construction project, right? You have owner, architect, engineer, contractor, and I see it like an onion, right? So it's like layer of onion, right? In, even in an IPD project, I integrated the project delivery model that I just showed you, and I said, this is the most collaborative form, because why? Because owner, architect, and contractor are on board early on. Even in that IPD model, if we, inter if we create an integrated team out of owner, AE, and general contractor, we, see, we still are missing a, a great deal of insight and knowledge that comes from downstream stakeholders throughout the supply chain, right? So how can we have horizontal integration, and by horizontal integration, I mean integration between owner, architect, and GC, as well as vertical integration, which is, uh, which is including and involving and integrating um, team members down the, who are usually get involved downstream in the supply chain, subs, fabricators, suppliers. So a supply chain informed design is a concept that we propose, right? That basically says that, okay, so if, if I have the involvement of suppliers, key suppliers on board during the design phase, they can actually inform the designer and engineer 
as the availability or long lead uh, time for certain products, right? So if, if there is this system that the AE is counting on and is using in their drawing, and they know that the long lead time for this item is so long and it's going to delay the project, or this specific product is not available, right? Those information can actually help make or break the project, right? So, so supply chain informed design, horizontal integration and vertical integration are, are key to improving the supply chain. And we see in a traditional way, we, we see a very linear supply chain. The data flow is linear. And in any of these places, if we have a breakage um, in our chain, it's going to affect the project. And there is very limited visibility from people upstream, owner and architect and engineers, to the providers downstream. So how can we, the question is, how can we increase the visibility and how can we, ex we increase the accessibility to, to data? In another research, we proposed, well, which was funded by Construction Industry Institute, we proposed a new um, delivery model called C-Pepsi. And, and through C-Pepsi, we can actually gain much productivity and shorten the project schedule. So if, if, if this is a um, time and, and duration of different um, packages, compared to a traditional project, traditional delivery model, we can save this much on a, on a given project. And basically, uh, what this model suggests is that C, Little c stands for committed and collaborative early involvement of downstream uh, contractors and suppliers in the project. And it's very interesting, as you can see, we're even bringing these folks even before the engineer, engineering team uh, or engineering work starts, right? So if you know that there is a specific equipment that for sure you need in your project, why not involving those suppliers early on, develop the contract, have them start working on um, procuring and, and, and shipping that equipment for you to your project, and then, um, and then start the engineering. Break down the engineering packages to different packages so that you can do them concurrently. Then um, P, big P stands for, little P stands for the procurement of uh, remaining items. And then also breaking down construction into different construction packages, that can be done again simultaneously um, so that you can shorten the schedules. So modularization and offsite fabrication um, is actually something that is going to uh, enable these overlapping of co different construction packages. So CPEPC model, again, back to the problem that we saw in our industry, broken supply chain, lack of productivity, delayed project. If you implement CPEPC, um, to some extent you are going to overcome these issues and you can deliver uh, and implement emergency projects that where time is of essence. So the problem of broken supply chain. Another solution is digital transformation, right? If, he, if we can bring visibility to um, information that flows throughout the supply chain and this, the, the information that different stakeholders have, if we can make them available real time to all different stakeholders, that is going to really help improve the supply chain and prevent potential issues that we have been dealing with during pandemic. So, in this line, digital transformation, we have done um, different research, whether it be in terms of designing workflow processes, in terms of what, what do we mean by data? What kind of data? Who creates that data? And who uses that data? In what format? Will those data be interoperable or not? Can data be transferred from one technology to another technology? So these are all... Um, implementation uh, issues that needs to be figured out, right? So the concept is great, but to what, to what extent we can actually um, make it a reality? So in one research, we studied um, interoperability and how, how to design, um, how to define uh, data requirements, 
data providers, uh, data format during different phases of a project, and how to enable the auto transfer of data from building information modeling um, to the computerized maintenance management system of owners, right? So owners have their own uh, com computerized system to run buildings, right? And in order to run these buildings, we, they need data that comes from the systems that have been put in their projects, right? And all these data resides in them. Now the question is, how do you transfer this data automatically to the computerized maintenance management system of owners. So, so in one research, we studied that. Another research that we did, we look, in, look into um, billing information modeling and IoT devices, right? Um, in sp specifically, we looked at the interoperability between the two, right? Again, you, I showed you a slide where we said, what if the sensors that exist in the building provide the data uh, and put it back into the building information modeling. Okay, in order to do that, we have to work on how data can be communicated, can be transferred between these two different systems. There are different data formats, different data structures. How do you map the data process in order to uh, create that cyber physical system that we had in mind in terms of digital twin and physical twin? So, so in that research, we implemented um, information delivery model, model view definition, um, and basically the mapping process of the industry um, standard <laughs> that is used for BACnet and, and BIM, IFC. So addressing trust. Now, this goes back to both of your questions about what is trust augmenting technology. And, do we really need blockchain and smart contract to solve the trust problem? Why can't we just use the paper-based contract? So the fragmented and linear um, construction supply chain has, has created um, multiple issues. First of all, the fragmented and linear process has very low transparency Right? So for example, if I'm an owner or if I'm an architect and engineer, I have very limited um, visibility to what's happening here. Right? The status of materials I ordered, where it is, who is the raw material providers, all this data and information and the timing of delivery, we have very limited visibility. Right? right now you order things from Amazon, how visible it is. Very visible, right? You order material, you order product from Amazon, and you know exactly when it's going to be delivered, whether it's been shipped or not. So all these visibility, we want to bring it to a large, complex project where so many, so many different entities are involved. So that's our goal. The other problem is that because of this lack of transparency and visibility, it actually increases the risk of counterfeiting. Right? So if someone says, I'm providing this brand A material, but in reality it's not brand A, it's a fake brand A, and, and you are the owner, you're receiving that material, it's in, you install it in your building, and then later on things happen. And then you, you want to find out what happens, whose fault was it? And then you have to do forensic analysis. It's very difficult in the current linear supply chain with very m m limited visibility to find out who was at fault, who provided wrong information, um, et cetera. In addition, the linear um, process, it, it takes a lot of time for you to tell the owner, to tell the architect, to say, I want this. The architect says it to general contractors. The general contractor says it to subcontractors. Versus imagine if I want it, how, what if I can go directly to this person and ask for this data? So I don't need to, to wait for all these linkages of, uh, of chain to get what I want. So the delayed information flow, the delayed material flow, and it happens also for cash flow. So cash flow, the raw provider says, okay, here's the bill, my invoice, pay me. This would give that invoice to the sub. 
the sub would give that invoice to the GC. GC would give it to AE or owner directly. So it takes a lot of time for them to get paid, right? So this delayed information material cash flow, uh, re the risk of counterfeiting and um, are, are key problems in the construction industry. The other problem is bid shopping and bid peddling. What does, it, what does it mean? So if I'm a specialty contractor and I want to get this job, the general contractor would say, I have this scope of work, let's say concrete pouring, um, and there are a bunch of specialty contractors who are specialized in that. They come and they submit their, um, they, they tell the GC, this is my price, right? So the GC usually get all these prices and there's a bidding deadline, right? So before the deadline, they actually verbally tell the GC, this is my price. And let's say if the GC favor a specific specialty contractor and they say, you know what, I really like you, but these other subcontractors gave me a lower price, can you lower your price? And they say, okay, I can lower your price. So this dynamic is, first of all, it's unethical. Second of all, it's not to the, it doesn't provide any benefit to anybody. Usually the subcontractors who lower their price to just get their foot in the door, once they're on board, they're looking for opportunities to create change orders and, and submit a new kind of um, uh, change order request as asking owner for more money in order to be that because I, I didn't have that in my initial scope. So they look for opportunities to to bring back their profit. So how can we prevent that? How can we ensure that, that the bidding would happen in a fair, ethical environment where everyone would be better off? So in our research, we have um, explored the role or the application of blockchain and smart contract to address these issues that we mentioned, low transparency in information sharing and heavy administrative uh, steps in processing information. So how does blockchain can help? Uh, blockchain can provide this data tr traceability and data immu immutability capability, right? So if you have this digital data uh, in cloud in um, blockchain network, then you can ensure that if someone is, is going to claim that this is brand A document, right, uh, or brand A product, you can actually trace that and you can easily verify uh, whether that's true or not. If someone tries to change the information, again, uh, it's impossible, right? So, so data traceability and data immutability of blockchain bring more transparency it's easier to do forensic analysis if needed. And the smart contract is going to automate the process. So smart contract operates on if-then condition, right? So if you provide this service, then I'm going to release this money to you, right? So the, back to your question, why do I need smart contract if the traditional contract works, right? So all those administrative steps that are needed, which I showed in that linear graph, that comes from, um, from one entity to another, right? All these. If we have a, a BIM-based environment together with blockchain, together with smart contract, right? Let's imagine a hypothetical scenario. Your um, product arrives on site you update that information in your building information modeling platform which resides in, in cloud. So you say, item X arrived, the manufacturer information is that, quality control was performed, this, uh, this is the invoice, and you upload it in blockchain where uh, that information can stay uh, intact, no one can change it later on. And, and then there is the smart contract that really says, okay, so according to the input provided by BIM, uh, the condition is satisfied, therefore the payment is released, right? And the payment gets released to the entity who provided the service, right? So all those 
paperwork steps that used to happen in traditional process, we're eliminating it here. Right? Through the use of smart contract, um, those, those administrative steps are removed, and the payment and the cash flow uh, can, is, is, is simultaneous. I mean, it, it's instantaneous, so to speak. So you don't need to wait for three months of things to be processed and paperwork to go from one entity to another. The smart contract just executes the contract. Hope that answered your question. So would a person also need to verify that the service has been? Yes, and they do it here, at, right at this, at this step, right? So they receive this service. They update it in the BIM model, in the building information model. Uh, they update the progress status. They said yes, delivered, approved, quality control was performed, um, satisfied, and this is the invoice, this is the warranty information. They upload all this information in the model. So in the database online, someone received them and someone reviewed them. So, um, so this is actually what the framework that we developed that, that really shows how this smart contract work with the 5D building information model where you have the, the model with the schedule, with the cost information, with the scope of work, and as the payment documents um, gets developed and the service is satisfied, the smart contract release payment. And I have the PhD student, Zhang Hong Yun, who actually work in this research here. So we have the experts sitting here if you have any further question. Another uh, thing that Zhang Hong uh, and I did was developing a smart contract for, for bidding and procurement. Um, so again, back to the issue of uh, bid shopping. What if we create a system, a blockchain-based, blockchain-enabled uh, smart contract system where the subcontractors at the bidding deadline, they can submit their uh, bid prices. So it doesn't provide the opportunity for them to go around and, and, and do bid shopping. And this bid data, the smart contract, determine what's the lowest price. Of course, before that, um, the, the actual contractors who are reviewing the subcontractor qualification, they submit their evaluation, whether or not they feel this entity is, is qualified. And if, if the, the condition is met qualified, yes. And the, then the smart contract executes and selects the lowest bid. So lastly, but not least, is addressing labor shortage through industrializing construction. And um, there are different ways of in industrializing construction. One way is modularization, right? How can we, um, we build modular um, components offsite in a controlled environment? And research has shown that um, in terms of productivity, there, is a, there has been a case study on Miami Case Valley Hospital. In, in that case study, they said they gained 300 times more uh, productivity um, and in terms of safety, uh, zero uh, injury site, which is very, very foreign to the construction industry. Uh, better quality products. So um, one research, one active research that I am working on with my tech right now is, um, is understanding how to streamline the process of um, modularization and what are the environmental benefits in terms of sustainability and carbon footprint of modular construction versus traditional construction. Um, another way of industrial, industrializing construction is the use of robotics, right? So um, let's watch this video where um, it shows this brick laying uh, robot. Robotic construction is here. Meet Hadrian X. It is the world's first mobile robotic block laying machine and system. Capable of safely working outdoors in uncontrolled environments with speed and accuracy. 
Hadrian X builds block structures from a 3D CAD model, producing far less waste than traditional construction methods, while dramatically improving site safety. Humans have been laying bricks in the same way for the past 6,000 years. According to the 2019 survey of construction from the Census Bureau, the average completion time of a single-family home is around seven months. Hadrian X is capable of building the walls of a house in situ in as little as a day. Developed by FBR, the block-laying robot uses dynamic stabilization technology. DST corrects for dynamic interference and vibration in the boom and lay head in real time and places blocks with precision. All right. And then another example is uh, 3D printing. Reimagine. <laughs> Since the pandemic began, as we've witnessed, home prices have risen at the highest rate in 15 years, with so many people reconsidering where they want to live. That's right. But this morning, there may be a cost effective solution. And the answer could be a 3D printer. No joke. NBC's Kathy Park shows us how it works. Home building has a whole new look thanks to a 3D printer, unlike anything you've seen before just like you pick the house designs you want and you push print. Companies like Icon are creating homes from the ground up with their massive printer and a special concrete formula. For folks who may not understand the concept of 3D printing, what does it look like? What does it entail? So 3D printing is taking a digital file of a house design and layer by layer depositing material to build up the house in three dimensions, one layer at a time. Unlike traditional homes, which can take weeks or even months to frame, here, the walls and foundation can be ready in less than two days with a three to four person crew, bringing down production costs to as little as $4,000 per home. Aside from all the like efficiencies of automating construction uh, with regard to time and cost, concretes are an inherently resilient material. This more cost-effective construction could help make homes nationwide more affordable in the face of a changing climate. We build houses uh, in half the time for half the price. Our profits will be higher and we will be able to show that with more projects that we do. A 1,400 square foot, three bedroom, two bath home built in two days using 3D printing technology. Listed for just under $300,000, it's approximately half the cost of a comparable home in the same area. And offers came in by the thousands. We've been looking since September of last year. It's just impossible to find anything at this price. And this quality. How are 3D homes shaking up the housing market right now? 3D printed homes couldn't have come at a better time. We have a housing shortage and a labor shortage, and 3D printed homes really solve both those problems. Homes of the future, now a reality, as companies look to scale up with 3D. For today, Kathy Park, NBC News. It uh, looks like a paradox. We are trying and we are striving to automate our processes but in order to do that, we have to make a conscious effort to be creative and not think in an autopilot mode. So ask why, why, why all the time as students. Be very curious, be bold, say why not. All right, be alive. Thank you. If you could raise your hand so I could capture your audio if you have a question. One of the interesting things is to see how much of what you do seems like industrial engineering, scheduling and sequencing and systems thinking, and, and um, also supply chain, the procurement. Yes, absolutely. I think, you know, just as I showed, we are. We seem to be different specializations, but in the end, in order to make something really interesting, we have to come together. So I guess built environment is, is a, a place where you can actually apply all the skills and knowledges that you learn, bring it to built environment industry, and we can do great things. Yes? And to that point, companies like Amazon have brought it to our attention 
that um, it would be good for students in supply chain to have exposure to building construction. You know, instead of just designing the insides, thinking about what's next, mm -hmm. you know, and the scheduling and, and, and that type of thing, and getting exposure to more creative techniques and all. And um, as part of that, um, there's, uh, I think, one or two classes um, in your department that, the, that would be appropriate for the, the, the students to take. So if you are interested, and if you are a particular Amazon fellow, you're pretty much required, but um, um, there are opportunities. And I think you know, the students would be feel pretty comfortable. You know. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I have, uh, I teach design, integrated design construction and development processes. And I had students from ISYE in my class in the past. I also teach building information modeling. Uh, if you are an undergraduate, we have a minor in sustainable construction. You can, you can get a minor. Um, if you're interested in a graduate degree in building construction, uh, we have uh, a whole host of uh, flavors of uh, our MS, uh, whether it's online. Uh, we have an online PMUSH. We have a Master of Science in Building Construction and Facility Management. It has three tracks, uh, Program and Facility Management. Um, it has Technology track, and it has Thesis track. So, so if you're interested, uh, uh, just come and see me, and I, I'll be happy to help you. Any other questions? Yes, please. Um, I'm a little curious about the future of the beam. Uh -huh. Because I'm wondering the necessity of the beam or digital twin, yeah. whatever. Because I think for many or for most of the buildings, like for example for ISY main building, the beam will be a bonus instead of necessity, right? Will be what? Would be a bonus. A luxury. Yeah, I mean. Because if we wanted to, let's say, for example, monitor the structural health of this building, mm -hmm. we need to actually um, set a lot of sensors, mm -hmm. like the GPS sensor, like the vibration sensors, mm -hmm. in many of the locations. Yeah. And we also need some electricity to, mm -hmm. some electricity for those sensors, and also um, some GPS, uh, some Wi-Fi mode mm -hmm. to get the data. Mm -hmm. So that kind of price of course, will be really high. Mm -hmm. So uh, what do you think about the necessity for the beam for its future? Because in the case that many of the buildings actually don't need such kind of uh, very complex system. Mm -hmm. that's yeah, that, that, that's a really good question. So you, basically, your question comes down into to what extent we will see the return on investment on, on investing on these new technologies. Um, and just like any technology, right, that at the beginning of, at the advent of any technology, you see that the cost, their cost is high, the learning curve um, is involved, um, it, it hasn't been tested in terms of uh, people figuring out how most efficiently transfer this data. So at the beginning, the cost may, right now, may seem to be high, uh, but after these, uh, prototype beta testing is uh, is done, is completed, it's validated, it's figured out, then the costs of implementing this technology are not going to be that high. And hopefully at that time, the return on investment would be higher. Um, so, so I'll definitely, I, I see it in the future. Now, at what point we get to that point that it's no longer a luxury, right? Right now it looks like a luxury, but at some point in the future it may not be a luxury. Just like uh, how you have in your car a dashboard where you can monitor everything, right? What if we have a dashboard where, where you can see the 3D model of your house and you can just touch and you can click and you can get all the data about the performance, airflow, temperature, Etc. Etc. So right now it looks like a luxury, but in future it won't be. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if you think that this type of technology could be applied applied to conceptual smart cities like the Line in Saudi Arabia that will accommodate like nine million people. Is this technology that might be implemented into that smart city to make it even better? Oh yeah. 
Oh yeah, absolutely, right? Yes. Yeah, so they, the, any smart cities are actually smart cities are relying on these kind of uh, sensors and IoT network and devices and technologies. Yes. Thank you. Are you a design student, by the way? Because because I have seen you in our presentations. I have friends that are design okay, students. Okay, gotcha. I just had a quick question with uh -huh. regards to uh, in a constrained economic environment, mm -hmm. different financing and insurance regimes that would support these things. You know, Saudi Arabia has a very unique financing. Uh, capacity mm -hmm. that other countries don't. Mm -hmm. So I was curious, have you seen anything else? And also like a good example with regards to smart cities because in Singapore and South Korea, they don't seem to have really jumped off the deep end with it, but in, in China they have. Mm -hmm. So it seems that a, poli a political economy mm -hmm. really matters with mm -hmm. regards to how those things develop. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, really great question. Um, because in the end, it comes down to decision makers, politicians, um, funding organizations to actually uh, allocate budgets, create incentives. Uh, for the builders or even for the users to implement these new um, technologies that if they see that it could bring benefits in terms of um, how they can have a, a stronger defense, how they can um, save operational money. Um, so if they see all these benefits, like China, for example, is the one that have seen that and have realized that. And so if the decision makers and politicians allocate budget and create incentive programs, then you see that it actually facilitates how quickly these things are taken off versus in other places may take a while until uh, it gets implemented. But really great question. So I guess kind of building onto that, has any of this been pitched to any local or state governing bodies? Because I know the per, uh, in terms of permitting and zoning, that process can take weeks. Oh, and that's so, a really good question. So them being integrated into that chain with visibility. Yes, that's a really good question. So we have a, a, a master, a, a, the director of our MRED program, which is a real estate development program. Uh, Professor uh, Rick Porter, and he, he's a, he has been practitioner in the industry and now he's a professor of practice, uh, and he has his whole, own firm. And, and that's exactly what he has, he has uh, brought up to my attention, that, that we, there is a need for actually utilizing BIM um, to automate the process of checking for compliance with codes and approvals and permits. So this has not been happened yet, but it needs researchers <laughs> like me or others, like Jung Hun, maybe you can do that, um, to, to start developing systems that could automatically, like using Solibri uh, or other, um, other code checking, to, to use the BIM data to see whether it comply or not, and, and that could expedite the process of approval and permits. So that's a great application that you just mentioned. Yeah. Um, I had like two questions. One of them is adding on to um, Connell's question and it's like, um, so like we talked, like I guess like a lot of these require a lot of like capital investment in the beginning, but what do you think could be um, one of the things that um, like third world countries or developing countries could do in order to like start moving into this direction. What is one of, what is one of the re, one of the actions that you think they should take in order to start kind of moving into that direction? Is my first question. So I, I always tell my students that you know don't implement a technology for the sake of it being a technology or cool, right? You always ask your question. What is the purpose? What am I trying to achieve? And whether or not this makes my job easier, more efficient, right? And so, in any country, whether it's be whether it be developing country or developed country, if you are um, doing your research and doing your analysis, figuring out 
for this purpose, this particular technology could save me this much time, this much money, um, make my job more accurate, whatever the benefit, the bottom line benefits are. Once you know those benefits, then whoever is in decision making in your company, in your organization, in your government, if you go about and go and educate these people and do demo, this is how we can benefit from this. This is how we can operate much more efficiently. And this is how much in, in a larger scale of applications in long term we could really get ahead of the game. Then, then that's how you can do it. Then the, how, that's how you can um, facilitate adoption of new or advanced technologies. Um, other question that I have was basically um, like thinking about it in like a bigger scale, not necessarily like just houses. Um, like with all like the technology that like you were talking about, like digital transformation, blockchains, and all of these, and like the differences in the communities. So like. There's obviously like like different kinds of breakdowns in every community. Like some communities have a lot more like workspaces. Other communities are very like hospital centered and whatnot. So like and like the technology needed and like the data storage for all of this will be very different depending on the communities um, that you're working in, um, which makes each building that you're making very unique mm -hmm. and very different than the other like than any other building that you're going to be making so how does this play a role in like resiliency and like production and making and like actually the construction of these buildings if a lot of them are very like unique in what they need in order to operate in like the digital way yeah so what what we are proposing here is a framework that can be applied and adopted to different uh, communities. So it's not like we are saying that um, you need X, Y, and Z, right? And that X, Y, and Z are building specific. What we are providing is that a framework, a process map, whether uh, that, that regardless of which community are you from, whether you're from healthcare, whether from residential, you take this framework and you say, okay, the first step, step that we need to do is to figure out what data we can provide or what data we need from the city, right? So the first step is saying that, right? So we go and do that, right? So, so this way, it's not so much about um, project specific information. It's a framework that anyone can adopt. Great questions. Thank you so much for your engagement. Thank you so much.